I write a lot about my family. I write a lot about my internal landscape. I've been a spiritual seeker. I grew up a Catholic. Um, I call myself a recovering Catholic. And um, went to Naropa Institute, which is a Buddhist institute, and studied with Allen Ginsberg. And I'm currently affiliated with the Sufi order. So I write a lot. I try to use my writing to talk about my spiritual insights and use poetry as the vehicle to try to convey what that experience is like, because it's very hard to talk about. So that would be a, a, a large part of my writing. Well, I think I had a hard time just accepting that I was a human being and had a body and had to walk on the earth because I always wanted to be an angel. And the nuns had told me about a saint that died when she received her first communion and went straight to heaven. So when I received my first communion, I prayed real hard that I would die. And I was real disappointed when I didn't die after I had my first communion. So um, it took me a long time to sort of get in my body and, and realize I'm a human being and I have a body and I have to live here first and bring the spiritual realm into the earth. So that's what I'm working on, I guess, at this part of my life. Well, I have a, a chat book called The Lives of the Saints, and those were persona poems, and the voices started coming to me after I did a, a mantra about compassion. And so I assumed the voice of those people and told their story. One is a mother who, who murdered her four children, and I tried to write that poem for a long time, but I couldn't write the poem about her. I had to become her and let her speak and enter her experience to tell that story. And one is the um, Richard Speck victims of the, the nurses in the 60s where he killed the, the student nurses. And I wrote the story from the surviving nurse who was under the bed and experienced all of that. And the voices kind of came to me. By giving the person a voice. So I would assume their voice and say I, speaking as they speak, and then let their voice speak the story through me so it's not my story, it's their story and they're saying I and they're speaking through me. And I, so I, I give them voice and I think especially in this book, there are people that, some of them are people that, that ordinarily a lot of people would not have sympathy for. but. But yet their circumstance, I think, also deserved compassion, and somebody had to give voice to their situation. But actually, that book started as we had a little girl that disappeared in town who was nine years old, and it's assumed that she was raped and murdered, but her body was never found. And her voice started coming to me. I mean, I didn't exactly literally hear the voice, but her story, and it's like someone needed to speak for her. And so the first poems I wrote were her poems, which actually never ended up in the book. But once I opened up to letting her voice through, these other voices started to come through. And they were more like insistent little naggings in my head. It wasn't like I literally heard a voice, but the idea kept nagging until I gave it a voice. Well, the biggest encouragement was Allen Ginsberg, who got me started and told me I was a writer and, and told me to give readings. And then I think I was on my own for a long time because I live in Norfolk. There weren't other writers around. In fact, there was someone on the faculty who was a writer and was very chauvinistic and looked at my work and discouraged me from writing. And I had to overcome that. And then I was fortunate enough to connect with poets from Lincoln like Marge Sizer and, and Twyla Hansen who encouraged me to come to Lincoln and write with them, and they've been a great support. But I probably the biggest part of it has been what I got out of it, whether or not anybody read it or I got any fame or accord, is I could see myself growing, and I became much more aware of myself and who I was. And my memory got better because I was always noticing things and writing them down. And so writing itself reaped all these rewards that I knew I was never going to quit no matter what. Allen Ginsberg is a great big spirit who 
probably changed the course of American poetry because he took it out of the academic realm and put it into the spoken realm. His poem, Howl, overcame the obscenity trial and he broke through where he could write about homosexuality and things that people never said in public and make that be okay and took the whole course of American poetry off into another direction than it was going. But besides being a poet, he's a great being. Uh, he fought for lots of causes. I think he's one of the first people to come out of the closet as far as being gay. He, every place something was happening in the 60s and 70s, Ginsburg was there. He was at the Democratic Convention. Um, he sat on the railroad tracks at Rocky Flats to stop the train from bringing nuclear waste. He said he had more files on the FBI and CIA than they had on him. He actually was a great American because he called America on her ideals and the things that she stood for. My friend got a flyer from an institute called Naropa and it was founded by a Tibetan Buddhist Lama who got kicked out of Tibet and he came and got a psychology de degree at Oxford and then he saw the Rocky Mountains and said, oh this reminds me of Tibet, I will found an institute here. So he started a Buddhist an institute for meditation and Buddhist studies. Then he ran into Allen Ginsberg on a street in New York City by accident, and Allen became his student. And Chogam Trumka, who founded the institute, said for people to talk about the enlightened state of mind, they will have to be poets, because there's no other way to talk about that state of mind. And I think he encouraged me because he thought I was sincere and I really wanted to be a writer, and, and Ginsburg really made himself available for anybody that wanted that teaching. Well, my name is Vicki Clark, and I'd like to welcome you here to the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, and tonight is the 111th John H. Ames Reading Series, so um, I'm glad you're all here tonight with us. The Heritage Room is a special collection of works that are written by and about Nebraska authors, and currently we have a collection of over 3,000 Nebraska authors here uh, with um, a collection of over 10,000 volumes that they've written. So that's a really wonderful, rich heritage that Nebraska has produced here. And in an effort to promote these authors, um, the Heritage Room, along with the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, sponsors this reading series so that the authors can come and meet with a local audience, and then the audience can meet with the authors as well. And I'd like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it's through an endowment that they established through their volunteer efforts that we're able to bring you programs like this. So we're very, very grateful to their assistance um, so that we can bring these kind of programs to you. And I'd like to invite all of you to come up and visit our collection during our public service hours when you can because it's just a really wonderful thing to see the wonderful talent that's here in Nebraska and that we all should be very proud of. But tonight, I'd like to introduce Barbara Schmitz to you. She is a native of Nebraska. Um, currently, she teaches creative and English, uh, English and creative writing, or creative English, is that right? <laughs> English and creative writing at Northeast College in Norfolk, Nebraska. Her writing, both poetry and essay, can be described as, an ex as expressing an inner landscape, which has been inspired by family and spiritual themes. And Barbara's work has appeared in many journals and anthologies, including her own collections, Lives of the Saints, and Making Tracks. As a student, she had the honor of being selected by poet Allen Ginsberg to be his apprentice at the Naropa Institute, where she also helped him assemble his notebooks. And in 1997, she was awarded the Nebraska Arts Council's Poetry Award. It's been almost 12 years since Barbara has read for the Ames series uh, for the first time, so I will hope you will, in, will join me tonight and welcome her back for her reading tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to come back here again. And I always love driving into Lincoln and it's really, honest to goodness, a thrill to look up and see the Capitol building. And I go, there it is. It's almost like seeing the mountains or something. I would like to thank Nancy McCleary, who recommended me to read here again, and J.V. Brummels, who's not here tonight, but I understand he also recommended me. Well, since we mentioned Allen Ginsberg, and I've been thinking about him quite a lot lately, I've been teaching him to my uh, Intro to Poetry students. I have a poem I wrote 
when he died about a year ago. And I've never read that anywhere in public, so I thought I'd like to start my reading with that. And maybe one little short Allen Ginsberg poem, if you're not familiar with his work. One of the nice things about Allen's work is he had a tremendous sense of presence, of watching and observing things very quietly and presently and putting them down. And so this is just a little snippet of a Ginsburg style. Fourth floor dawn, up all night, writing letters. Pigeons shake their wings on the copper church roof out my window across the street. A bird perched on the cross surveys the city's blue-gray clouds. Larry Rivers will come at 10 a.m. and take my picture. I'm taking your picture, pigeons. I'm writing you down, Don. I'm immortalizing your exhaust Avenue A bus. Oh, thought, now you'll have to think the same thing forever. So that's typical Allen Ginsberg. This is the poem I wrote for him. Actually, I wrote two or three, but this is the one I like the best after he left the planet. I called it, Oh, Alan, My Alan, because he believed he was in the line of poets from Walt Whitman to William Carlos Williams. And of course, Whitman's famous poem, Oh, Captain, My Captain. And I was also trying to pick up a little bit on the rhythms of, of Howl in here with the Who's. So I was trying a few things with uh, form as well as content. Oh, Alan, my Alan, for my teacher. Oh, and by the way, um, I just found out that Allen Ginsberg is the person who coined the phrase flower children. And that John Lennon changed the spelling of the Beatles to B-E-A-T because he liked the beats so much, the beat writers. Oh, Alan, my Alan. Great grandson of Walt Whitman, child of Dr. Williams, father to the flower children, seducer of young boys, champion of true blue America, caller for the righteous, the beautiful, goofy stroke grin, delight in words and how wacky the world is, teacher of compassion, my writing teacher. You write all this? looking in my notebook. You live with someone? Looking at my drawing of Rainbow Man. How do you write? You ought to be giving readings. Alan, who gave me permission to be a writer. Talking to a tape recorder for a couple hours. Write without stopping for an hour or two. Who sat on the railroad tracks at Rocky Flats, a train coming to get arrested and claimed he had more files on the FBI and CIA than they had on him. Alan, who always forgot my name, I was his apprentice, while rattling off the names of boys. Alan, who said I always had something to say, but shook his head over my form. Alan, who asked me to dinner when I was feeling blue, asked me if I needed money, Asked me if I had some Jackson Brown tapes he could listen to because Bob Dylan told him to. Alan, who showed us all in class how to meditate. In his Salvation Army clothes, cl big beard, later close shaven. Alan, a little divine, mostly human. Alan, who is gone from the earth, wrote lots of poems about death. Alan, who's been appearing almost every night in my dreams. All right, I'd like to read about four poems from my little book, The Lives of the Saints. And the thing I need to tell you about this is these were voices that came to me. Not so much a literal voice I would hear in my head, but more a story that kept compelling me to tell it, to tell it, to tell it, until I wrote it down. And at the time, I was doing a mantra I'd been given about compassion. And I, I see a direct correlation between telling these stories and trying to invoke compassion. And several of these stories um, I could not write until I let the person themselves do the speaking, saying I, and assuming their persona. The first one is called The Burden. It's my aunt speaking. She had a, a daughter who had encephalitis. Um, 
who had a very large head, and she lived until she was 12 years old, and I was about 10 years old when she died. I wasn't allowed to go to the funeral because I had mumps, but I remember my aunt standing in the kitchen telling my mother about how heartbreaking it was talking to the priest, and I'll never forget it. I was 10 years old, and, and until I let my aunt tell the story, I never was able to write it down. So it's called The Burden. Jody died on Mother's Day. I was saying to my sister at the lunch after the funeral mass, I had a little angel on Mother's Day. The priest set his hand sandwich on his plate and turned to me. I must correct you about that, he said. There were a fixed number of angels in the beginning. No more will be made, so your daughter cannot be an angel. And then he swallowed and took another bite. I finished chewing my mouthful of poppy seed kolache and stared at him, full in the face. I kept Jody in a kitchen crib, changing her diapers and spooning baby food into her expressionless face, always careful to support her huge head when I'd lift her bony body with her viney arms and legs. I never heard her say, I love you, only moan soft sometimes when I'd lay her on relatives' beds with the cat hats and coats. She never looked when I called her name. Big blue veins pulsing on her forehead, hair growing far back. I'd have to sweep the flies from her lips on sticky, hot summer days. The police priest cleared his throat and said, well, maybe you have a saint. Yes, a saint. And I know my sisters whispered, what a blessing for her, now that burden's gone. But at night, a lonely blue buzzing seems to be trailing me. And when I go out, my arms are too light. They float up around my face, needing something heavy to carry. And then I had a writing student who told me, came to class and told me that her best friend just delivered twins. And one of the twins was born alive and one of the twins was born dead. And I couldn't stop thinking about that, um, to have those two things happen simultaneously. So I let the live twin tell the story. And this is called The Twin. My mother delivered me, the living, first. My head battered open her door, and I squeezed through the gate, out into blaze, babble, and arms that were waiting to hold me. Once I was wiped free from all the evidence of my bloody beginning and my closeness to the dangerous edge. My twin sister was dealt a different fate. She returned to the ether without a parent's touch on skin, a sparkling look from a loving eye. She was pushed from the womb after me, already lifeless and black. My mother laughed and cried, looking from my squirming form to her small, quiet body. All at once, such celebration, such grief. I made friends with death, growing next to its utter stillness, long before I tasted the nectar of my mother's breast, or heard my father's voice naming me. Warmth and cooing filled my side of the scale, nothingness and the beat of angel wings was the balance my twin on the other side weighed. Okay, I'll give you a couple more of these. They're not all so depressing. <laughs> My husband had trouble with this book. But I said I didn't particularly like it either, but something there was something compelling about these voices that somebody had to let them speak, so I guess that had to be me. This one is a woman I only met once, and she was telling me about her divorce, and she was a painter. And of course, when she got a divorce, her husband kept her paintings. <laughs> Painter divorced. 
He took my pink lips, first time sights, young girl sighs, all those early things, little bird I was, all hoppy and full of hope. I followed where he led me, not complaining. My mother said, don't marry so early. He loomed large like a mountain appearing sudden at the horizon of flat plains. He blocked the sun, but had his own strange light. I loved him with all my unknowing. It was almost impossible to unwind all the cords of my soul braided together with his, so big. He left a wound open and gaping when I finally pulled loose, wobbling on my own, alone. Why would he take all of my paintings? The canvas is so big, he was always complaining about how much space they took. Floppy flower things, he called them, making fun. There was not one he liked. When I had to leave, he hid them, said they belonged to him. I got the other stuff, said it was his right. Sometimes, I longed just to leaf through the stack, glancing at them, quick, like crumbling old photographs or fading faces of lost babies. This one is for Mary Pfeiffer. And I love therapy. I think therapy is wonderful. I've done a lot of therapy, um, but you have to know when it's time to quit therapy. So that's the secret. And um, this is not me, this is some other woman. Woman knows it's time to quit therapy. I was brushing my teeth, staring at my face in the mirror, and I just knew it. Then at that moment, the way I know some things, like I was once a beautiful woman, now aging, I rinsed my mouth, clicked my teeth together, practiced a smile. Today was my appointment, right before lunch. I would miss my dark-eyed counselor, who listened gently as a grandfather, supported my dreams like an American mom, heard my fears like a father confessor. I'm going, I said at the end. He merely nodded. No, for good, I said. How do you know, he asked. Like lightning, all the way to the ground in summer, I said. September's breeze, following August still. Like I knew with all my heart who I should marry. So long, he said. Then I have a little section of, uh, one of the things I like to do and I have my students do is write poems about photographs. And it works very well if they're photographs, of course, of, of you or people that you know that you have an emotional connection with. But this one's still in my persona book, so um, I set writing times for myself and I write that time whether I have anything to say or not. And I had 15 minutes, so I thought, what am I going to do? And so I imagined that I was my son going through the house and looking at photographs of me. And so this is a young boy looking at photographs of each of these photographs of his mother and what he has to say about each one of these photographs. Of course, there's some things that a young boy couldn't know when he looks at those, but just ignore that. <laughs> photographs of my mother as described by her son. Here she's putting on her coat. She was always ready to go before my dad. He never wanted to leave the house. Then she always wanted to come home early. Thanks, she'd say, before the puking and the weeping. Thanks, I've got to leave. In this one, she's holding out her new straw hat. Wore it one whole summer before I was born, to parties. Other people had their alcohol. She put on her hat. Here she's holding my teddy bear with dad and me under the Christmas tree. She likes soft things. Cuddled me too much, maybe. In her fuchsia sweater, her color. 
brings summer and sunrise to her face, brightens her ice eyes. She's at the picnic table when she used to sit in the sun, brown as light oak wood polished. She said she wished she'd been born an Indian, anything but white. Her confirmation, eyes turned upward toward the Holy Ghost. She had memorized the seven capital sins, all the works of mercy, knew the names of all the different levels of angels, always wanted to be a saint. She's holding me close. I'm a baby. We're both blurry shadows. My mom and dad together at the Rio Grande, both smiling. They argued all summer. She couldn't stand his smoking and eating in the tent all day. She went to sleep early and left him alone under New Mexico stars. She's smiling in her office chair after she came back from India. Somehow she moved slower then. Time seemed not to swirl around her knees, nipping at her ankles. She was always remembering to breathe. In this picture, she's writing a poem. Her hair wild like woolly sheep, rings on every finger, turquoise lightning symbol on her wrist. Her poem's about dad. She's young in a tree, long legs, long hair, empty face. Here, her chin rests on her hand, always trying to figure out how she'd get out of this place. Here we are, mom and me. She's beaming my mother's son into the camera, solid brick of love. She's holding me, but loosely. I'm looking around, not sure what I should do. I have a couple more that came from photographs. This one was a photograph of my parents dancing at their first granddaughter's wedding. My father had already had his eye removed and he had um, skin cancer. And it's quite a touching, beautiful photograph, but, but my mom was always upset after he had his eye removed because my dad used to be so handsome. And so when she looked at the photograph, she said, oh, you tear that up, that's terrible. You just tear that up. I didn't want to tear it up because it was such a triumph to me to see them dancing like that. And so I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. And then I wrote this poem and then I tore it up. So, but I have the poem. So it's called Dance Contest. She caves into him, her spine all bent. He's reptilian, coarse and lumpy. Part of his face gone to the land of the missing. They are dancing, dancing at their granddaughter's wedding. Old pumpkins carved and crumbling a week after Halloween. In less than a year, he'll have shed the skin all dried up. He carries his scars of time like a war hero, quiet dignity with medals dangling on his decorated chest. They are not pretty like the blonde bridal couple who could sit atop the cake, but they should win a trophy for gliding upright for their dancing. So I still have the photograph. And this is my dad and me dancing at the same wedding, and my dad can't dance, and I can't dance with him very well. <laughs> it's called two-step. We're dancing, my father and me. This isn't the dress I planned to wear. That one was pink. This one is green, but the pink one tore when I was washing it. I don't feel very pretty at this fancy wedding, but my father and I are shuffling along. He's not good at dancing. I always thought I could have been, but didn't get dance lessons and turned to stone when anyone looks at me. He's shorter like he is with my mother. We're banging toes, like our lives that only bumped, didn't match smooth, didn't reach deep 
into each other's language, foreign tongues. He'd say football, I'd say poem. He's smiling, so am I. It's our last, but we don't know. My dad died then a couple months after that. And I have a picture of my father holding me. It's the only picture I have of my dad holding me. And I was trying to figure out how old I was in there. And the more I, I stare at these pictures for a long time, and then the poem kind of emerges out of the picture. How my daddy held me. Baby girl in bonnet, fat, fat cheeks, hand in mouth. I'm staring at the camera. He's in a suit, in a tie. Big hand on my baby girl hip and belly, holding me, talking something, talking nice. He never sang. No one in my house did. Open the doors, old oh loved ones. Let in all the, all the music. I look dark. Now I'm blonde. Already my legs are long. He is a handsome father, white forehead, working hard, digging ditches for the water company. Autumn, I imagine, too much foliage for spring. About 50 years ago, he wasn't afraid to touch me then. And this one I wrote after I heard Gary Snyder being interviewed by Bill Moyers and singing this little song called Turquoise Blue has nothing to do with this poem, but I know that the poem is influenced by that. I don't know exactly what the influence is. And the phrase, Om Pa Papa, came to me. I never called my father that, but it, it's sort of the hook that took me into the poem and allowed me to talk about issues I had with my father and some dreams that came after he died. And I know it has something to do with Gary Snyder, but those mysterious connections, you can't always explain them. Om pa papa. Om pa, om pa, om pa papa. Where have you gone with your one eye? How can you see an eternity's dark? Do you turn your head a lot? Did you get a new body? One all shiny, pure, and light? Om pa, om pa, om pa papa. I see you in a dream. Shirt sleeves rolled over bulging biceps, tearing down a 57 Chevy. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa. You disappear in my husband's dream, diving into swirling dam water, coming up a gnarled corpse. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa. You disappear in prism light, bright pyramid ship in mine, my dream. Om pa, papa. You never said you loved me. Heart made of plumber's tools, pipes, and wrenches. A tube in your heart all night. I hold your face tight. Say I love you. You hold my hand. Tell me to sleep. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa. You still can't say you love me in my dream. Om pa, papa. Dahlia's, zinnias. Fists full of bright. You bring them brimming one hand, toolbox the other to fix my faucets. Om pa, om pa, papa, I see that you loved me. I pour beer in your garden. I sit in the chair you died in all night, trying, trying to feel you there. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa, you were gone, long flown, left a little wind, Tinkles chimes made of old pipe. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa. Your prayer book on my window ledge. Your worn thin like old shoes photograph. You and my mother, young, beautiful, smiling on a porch banister. Om pa, om pa, om pa, papa. It's your birthday this month. August, your middle name. Your sign, a Leo. The name your mother named you, Om Pa, Om Pa, Om Pa, Papa. Okay, I think we need a little lightening up, huh? So this will be an audience participation poem. I need a little help. It's about eating 
and all the screwy reasons we eat besides being hungry. And I wrote this uh, actually before we even knew there were eating disorders. And I was trying to write down all my neurotic eating habits so I could understand them and stop doing that. So it's kind of a chant poem. And uh, I'll read each line. And then your line will be, I eat. So I'll point to you guys and you say, I eat. And then I'll, I'll read my line, OK? Because I know you all like to eat. OK, so you'll help me, right? OK, I eat. I eat to relieve hunger. I eat. I eat when I'm nervous. I eat. I eat when I feel deprived. I eat. I eat when I feel depressed. I eat. I eat to put something in my mouth. I eat. I eat to wake up. I eat. I eat before I go to sleep. I eat. I eat to reward myself. I eat. I eat to punish myself. I eat. I eat because everyone else is eating. I eat. I eat because it's time to. I eat. Come on, you can do better than that. I eat because there's nothing to do. I eat. I eat because there's food left over. I eat. I eat because I'm cleaning out the pans. I eat. I eat because there's food in the refrigerator. I eat. I eat because it smells good. I eat. Looks good. I eat. Tastes good. I eat. I eat to taste cayenne. I eat. I eat because people tell me I should. I eat. I eat because my mother cooked it. I eat. I eat because I'm invited out to dinner. I eat. I eat because we're still talking. I eat. I eat because it's embarrassing not to. I eat. I eat because my dad says, why aren't you eating? I eat. I eat because my mother keeps passing things to me. I eat. I eat because there's food on the table. I eat. I eat because I want my husband to eat. I eat. I eat because I've cooked dinner. I eat. I think I have to eat to live. I eat. I eat when I feel skinny. I eat. I eat because I feel fat. I eat. I eat when I'm alone. I eat. I can't eat sometimes when I'm happy. I eat. I don't eat because my stomach's too big. I eat. I eat when other people can't see me. I eat late at night out of the refrigerator. I eat fast. I drop things on the floor when I eat. I eat health food. I don't drink when I eat. I eat on holidays. I eat at parties all night long. I sometimes eat with chopsticks. I eat in a wooden bowl. I eat on pottery. I don't like to eat on Mel Mac. I eat with a lot of spices. I use very little salt. I eat. I rarely eat in the morning. I eat. Can't stop eating at night. I eat. I complain that my stomach hurts when I eat. I eat. I feel self-righteous when I don't eat. I eat. I feel guilty a lot when I eat. I eat. I want to live on air. I want to live on light. And then I have this um, couple. They're are about in their 50s. And... I'm writing a, a series about the husband and wife in their 50s, so I have a couple of these husband and wife poems. And this is my eating group. So um, the husband finally in his 50s learned to make his own lunch. The husband finally learns to make his own lunch. They argued about it for years. She brought it up in therapy, those years when women were struggling to hold their heads up to the light, way beyond above the water. When she wanted the house duties divided, she would clean half the house. Still, a daughter of her mother, she couldn't stop planning meals, worrying about nutrition. When he didn't materialize food, she stepped forward dutifully after dinner or in the morning, mixing cottage cheese, pineapple, and little marshmallows together doling it into a wide mouth thermos so he'd have a meal at noon. Then something snapped or exploded or flew off or went to sleep. She really stopped caring whether or not he had something to eat at 12 p.m. Now he bustles about the airy kitchen, humming in the mornings after the coffee's brewed, slicing and buttering homemade bread. He's found a baker who delivers. He's happy. She's ecstatic. Bread in cellophane bags, sandwiched between 
the peace in their lives. And this husband's kind of a tricky guy. He likes to eat in bed. So this is the wife thinking about the husband's body. It, it's not an X-rated poem or anything. His stomach goes flat, then blooms out again like a deflated and blown up air mattress, losing weight and gaining it back again. If you wouldn't eat crackers in bed, she says. He nods. It's all the stuff you eat at night. He smiles. Goes straight to his bin below their two panda bears, pulls out two kinds of sugar-free cookies, raisin oatmeal and almond. Harvest crisps, seeded crackers, honey mustard pretzel pieces. Chinese torture, she calls it. Eyes squeezed shut on her pillow, body turned on its side. The munching, crunching, amplified louder even than the television. Some scientist reporting by how many thousands of miles the meteorite will miss the Earth 22 years from now. How will she get to sleep? She invites him to come into her dream. Maybe he'll be lighter there, more soft. Maybe the dream will be dark and quiet and they can doze intertwined. Angels wrapped in each other's wings. No buzzing, humming, chomp, or snore. Okay, I'll do a few more and leave some time for questions, I guess. Um, this one actually is a new poem. I was talking to my students about, uh, one of my students I thought needed to get more into his body and less in his head to write, and he didn't understand what I meant. And I had a yoga teacher in my class, and I said, will you teach us a little yoga at the first of class, and then we'll write? And I think we all wrote more from our bodies. And then I wrote this poem that actually happened about 19 years ago, because my son's just about 19. and. Um, the whole purpose of yoga is to, to find your center and to be centered and uh, pregnancy also did the same thing for me i felt very centered and so this poem is called yoga i stand on the edge of the top porch step balancing on one leg in a modified bow husband stop below arms full of wood mouth gaping be careful he yells i am i am I am, I say. Baby inside echoes, I am, I am, I am. Be safe, he adds. I am, I am, I say. Baby inside center, perfectly centered, both of us. Round belly, round baby, completely whole, together and separately. I am, we are. I am you, I am me, we are we. And Father, Father, makes the Holy Trinity. In a few more days, a hatching, a nativity. So I thought I'd give that to my son for his 19th birthday. <laughs> I read it to him, I said, do you like it? He goes, well, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll do this one. It's kind of long. Um, one of the things I try to do with my poetry is um, talk about my internal space and insights that I have. And in this poem, it was my friend's 30th birthday. She has a birthday on the summer solstice. The kundalini yoga people say if you do this particular chant two and a half hours before sunrise, for two and a half hours until the sun comes up, you'll get enlightened. And so we all went out to her farm the night before and camped out and got up in the morning. That's called almost. I almost got enlightened on Jean's 30th birthday. Late in the evening, people came to the car to see Eli, woke him up over and over. I was getting grumpy, having to nurse him again and again to put him back to sleep. We went to the hill above the farm, two and one half hours before sunrise, started the chanting, Ek, Ang, Kar, Sat, Nam, 
Siri wa guru. Adam came then, drunk and loud, talking all the time, talking over the chanting, ek ankar. I ignored him, sat nam. Right before dawn, the chant shot through my body, pushing me, Siri wa guru, to my feet. I grabbed the hand, ek ankar, of the person next to me, sat nam. We danced the chant, pulling others up. Siri wa guru, baby bouncing against my heart in his blue carrier, sleeping now. The chant danced me, ek ankar, around and around, sat nam, until the sky was light and bright, but no sun. Siri wa guru, walking beside Pat toward the farmhouse, ek ankar, others already inside, Sat Nam, someone popped a champagne cork, Siri Wa Guru. The sun popped up over the trees, a bleeding orange disc, Ek Ankar. I walked with Kathy in the road beside the ditch, Sat Nam. We talked about sex with mates and lovers, Siri Wa Guru. We all talked about sex then. I have to turn myself on, she said, Ek Ankar. I had gone through a wall. Some of me, Sat Nam, was on the other side, walking and moving my arms inside the dream. Siri Wa Guru. Sparkling gold glitter balls opening and closing, Ek Ankar, next to my face. It was so close, Sat Nam. Every time I tried to touch it, the kingdom of God, Siri Wa Guru, it moved just a little ways away. Arnie climbed the light pole. Kim brought Jean a black dress. Ek Ankar, Sat Nam, something sophisticated. Siri Wa Guru, now that she was 30. Back home, I tried to stay awake all day. Ek Ankar, like you're supposed to. Sat Nam, to get the full effect. I stared at the orange trumpets climbing the trellis. Siri Wa Guru, from my grandpa's green porch swing. Ek Ankar, rocking and staring, still trying to keep the sparkles. Sat Nam, the dream world growing fainter and fainter. Siri Wa Guru, like the mountains when you're returning. Sat Nam, to the plains. Just about had it. I think I'm mostly writing what comes from inside of me that calls to me to be written. For example, this, this book of the voices, my husband hated it. <laughs> he said, these are awful stories. Why would anybody want to read these? And I said, I don't like them either. But somebody had to speak for these people. And several people who I sent them to said, I don't like these. They're dark and they're grim. And I don't know why I would want to read them. And I said, I don't know either. But somehow it seemed that I was the vehicle and I had to speak for them. So that's what it is. So I, I don't really have in mind that a lot of people are going to want to read what I'm writing necessarily. It's something that's more compelling about it that for some reason it's compelling me to write it. I think everybody has to find their way that works for them. And my best poems actually kind of come when I empty myself of all the stuff and concepts and have written a lot several days in a row, maybe nothing that I particularly like, but I've been engaging the process. And then because I've been practicing like for the football game, I'm ready when that great poem comes and I just catch it when it comes through, you know, and it's all there. I often think about where I fit as a Nebraska writer because I don't have any windmills. And I hardly have a cow in my poem. And I didn't grow up on a farm, although my father did. Um, but I've always lived here, so I'm sure, I mean, my experience has come out of the land and out of the earth and out of the people, and it's a part of who I am. And my landscape, I think, is more a psychological landscape and a spiritual landscape, and I, real ha I have a real love and interest and curiosity in people. And so that's what I think shows up in my work. And it, it can't help but be reflected that I've always lived here, except for my travels. But I don't have a lot of, I guess what you would call, poems of place. 
I think I would really like my work to reflect the triumph of the human spirit and people who struggle with everyday life. I think everyone is very heroic just to get out of bed in the morning <laughs> and do the things that we have to do because everybody's lives are full of sorrow and loss, but we don't lie down and whine about it. Most people get up and pick up that burden and carry it and are very triumphant, courageous, generous, loving human beings. And I, I hope that my work would reflect some of my own struggle with those things and the people that I see around me who are triumphant in that kind of way. Well, I'll just, in Nebraska where I was talking about poems of place and sometimes I don't feel like a Nebraska poet because I don't have any windmills and I don't have any cows and I didn't grow up on a farm and, and I always feel like I don't have my poem of place and so this is kind of a joke poem but um, it's my little poem of place. Well, place also means internal place as well as external. Why are we so attached to our bodies, bodies, bodies? They will drop away anyway and echo, echo down a well. And what we are, what we will be, will stretch out and sigh. A long breath circling the earth, expanding to fill all the space of the universe. A kid out of school for endless summer vacation. <laughs> well, that's my poem of place. <laughs> and I'll do two more. This one I wrote for my grandnieces. I have five grandnieces. And I said, yeah, I have something to say to those kids. So this is called Listen Girls for Victoria, Olivia, Alyssa, Faith, and Alexis, my grandnieces approaching the millennium. The world is constructed with hard edges, rectangles, corners, shapes that can poke bruise, hurt, it could use some softening. Stop. Stretch out your girl child hands over the earth. Send deep blessings from your budding hearts. The planet is churning up a new century. Take soothing feminine balm from the beat, beat, beating of your blood and spread calm over the frenzied, frazzled, time-worn source. Your lives stretch and reach and bloom forth toward the sun as we move through times of light and dark. Whisper in sweet voices about those grandmothers, great-grandmothers, and the men who love them. How all the years of sweat and weeping have brought forth a strong and lasting crop. You, my dears, the descendants of toiling, tender lives. Lightly hold new shoots, view sunlight through soft daisy petals and fragile peach skin. Remember and begin. And my last one, I think Bill Clefgren said you should write a poem about what you've learned. And I was mad at somebody the other day on the faculty who uh, highlighted all my mistakes on a handout and put it back in my mailbox. <laughs> And I was so irritated, I decided I'd use that and write a poem. So it's called, What Have I Learned? What have I learned? That most would rather find fault, tear into tiny holes, enlarging and exaggerating, rather than bring a thread and needle, help to repair or mend. What have I learned? Not monkey see, monkey do. Monkey turn away, don't look. Don't let arrows nick your hide. Grow tough skin. Keep heart tender. What have I learned? To pick up many tiny pebbles painted, forgive, forgive. Leave behind huge heavy boulders labeled revenge, labeled hate. What have I learned? Hold tight this movie dress body life called mine. Put it on. Admire all the glowing. Disregard tiny stains. What have I learned? 
like the mother of the suicide leaving hospital into the dawn. The sun will rise today. It always has. It always does. Thank you.